Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Massive thanks to the author, Prophetic Hose for allowing me to adapt their awesome story. Follow the link in the description to check out more of their works. Today we will be listening to the final part of what if Mirko became a UA teacher. If you enjoy, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing down below and don't forget to hit that bell icon so you get notified when videos go live. Now, without further ado, let's get into the video. Chapter 6, Summer Camp Hey now, sorry for the silent treatment, Nedzu's orders, Rumi sighs as she peels her leotard off her skin. No worries, we know how it went last year with their summer camp, Rumi hums in understanding, I don't really have any updates, all villains have been quiet since you helped take down the rest of the PLF. Even the HSPC hasn't had any cases for you to deal with. Well I guess that means I need to focus on the kids then. Rumi asks as she pulls on her loose shirt, great for the summer weather. Heh, the Rumi I used to know would've swore them out for not having a villain for her to hunt down, now chuckles over the phone, Rumi rolls her eyes as now knows that she's doing that, but besides that, the hero billboard charts are coming up soon. They pushed it forward to give more confidence to the public. Your official invite came in the mail to be yesterday. It's mandatory per request by the HSPC. Yeah I can go don't worry, Rumi waves over to the phone sitting on her cot, there's gonna be lots of changes with the rankings after everything that went down with the war. Oh yeah, there's rumors that you're moving up a spot or two given everything. Shit really? That's pretty awesome if that's the case. MMM, you get to bring a plus one by the way. That green haired boyfriend of yours would be a good fit for that role, now comments nonchalantly, causing Rumi to sputter for a moment. Wah boyfriend? Him. Now, please. You know I work alone and that means in all aspects of my life, Rumi denies the accusation, even if the bright blush on her cheeks agreed with now. Oh so -er, he's just only the first guy you can't stop talking about. It's clear that you like him and from what you said he's certainly a catch. Besides you were lying about all of that anyway, otherwise we wouldn't be talking now, now lists the reasons as if they were obvious they were. Nuh-uh, you earned the right to talk to me when you threw that plant pot at me at the HSPC headquarters. He hasn't done anything like that, not even to speak about him being a, a boyfriend, Rumi counters as she pulls on her nice boots. Okay honey, I'll let you stew on that then. I'll email you the invitation. Toodles the phone line clicks dead as now hangs up on the conversation. To be honest, Rumi doesn't know why she was denying now about her feelings towards the green haired teacher. Probably to give her less teasing material down the line. But deep down, she knows that she wants to date the guy. He certainly was her type, meaning he could easily pick her up and hold her over his head without breaking a sweat. And nerdy too, that was just too cute. And that was where the problem lay, with the fact that Rumi had actually never dated anyone before. Back at school, everyone that had ended up asking her out had done it for one of two reasons, the quirk or to be crushed between her thighs. But never for Rumi herself. So she was a technically virgin when it came to dating and was a little scared of doing it wrong and losing him forever. Quickly Rumi shakes her head out of those thoughts. She was a rabbit who takes what she wants. And she wants a tall glass of her green haired wrench monkey. Pushing the door open, Rumi takes in the refreshing smell of wet dirt and living bark, with a hint of a lit campfire somewhere nearby. She had found herself joining the staff for the yearly summer camp for the hero course. The first years had ended up going to the wild wild pussycats again, given their experience in developing quirks and their expansive woodlands. After the events that occurred during last year's summer camp, they had considerably increased their security within their territory, making it near impossible for anybody to sneak on it, through teleportation or otherwise. But because of their task to help develop the students, Midoriya had naturally been asked to join, offering his direct expertise to each of the students. His advice was something that just couldn't be denied. Looking around, she follows the noise of the kids chatting, having finished with their training for the day and now enjoying making s mores over the large campfire. On the edge of the gathering, Rumi spots the other adults in the group. The pussycats all talking amongst themselves with a smaller kid standing around with them. So probably a relative. Izawa was staring at the students, probably making sure that they didn't accidentally set themselves on fire when making their delicious treat. Sekhaiteru meanwhile was joining in in making the delicious treat, and then finally to Izuku who was braiding a little girl's hair. Wait, who was she? She had a small brown horn on her head, with long silver hair and bright red eyes. 
she was looking up at Midoriya, smiling happily at him while he played with her, making little jokes with her to make the girl giggle with glee. And with that adorable sight, Rumi can't help but think that maybe, just maybe that was his kid. His actual biological kid. Was he already with somebody and she didn't know? He never shared too much about his family, only just on how it related to the blonde bomber kid. Had she already missed her chance? Damn it, she knew she shouldn't TVE gotten her hopes up. But a tap on her shoulder stopped Rumi's train of thought as she turned around to spot a taller blonde girl smiling at her. Hey there, Myriko Wright, the girl said, holding out her hand in greeting. Accepting the handshake dumbly, Rumi stares back at the taller girl, and just who the fuck are you? You don't look like one of the hero kids. Oh no, I'm not here with them, the girl laughed, I'm Melissa Shield, or Shield Melissa if I remember your naming conventions correctly. You from out of town then? And how did you get in here? Rumi takes a step back, tensing in case she was somehow an intruder, however unlikely. From the states, Izuku invited me to join, first name basis, oh wait, she's from America so it's probably nothing, I wanted to talk with you though. Huh? What about? Rumi raises an eyebrow as she follows Melissa over to a nearby log to sit down at. You help take down all for one, it's something you should be thanked for, Rumi nods, accepting the praise humbly, Uncle Might had mentioned you before so I wanted to get to know you better, if that's fine with you. Uh sure, Rumi looks the girl up and down, she was quite young, older than the hero kids sure, but still in school, but first what brought you here? Like I said, Izuku had invited me to join along. He wanted me to connect better with the hero course before I got fully integrated in the support department, Melissa explains, watching one of the kids marshmallows catch on fire, only for Takakawa to extinguish it with an excessive amount of water. Oh, you his apprentice or something. A little bit, he was part of my inspiration to work harder as a support engineer. I've just started my own degree for it, but Izuku asked if I wanted the experience of doing it at UA with him and I couldn't just say no, Melissa says with a sigh, smiling at a memory of some kind. And just how did you meet Midoriya then? He never told me he had been to America before, Rumi turns to the blonde. No, he hasn't to my knowledge. I grew up on I Island and when he moved there for his studies, we connected easily. He's like an older brother to me, Rumi hums, understanding how someone would want to learn from a genius like Midoriya, especially how we're both quirkless after all. Rumi sputters in shock at the causal reveal, after it had such a hard topic for Midoriya to talk about. Oh yeah, that's the normal reaction. But I know about what it was like for him to grow up here quirkless. It was a lot worse for him than it was for me on I Island, especially being the daughter of a top scientist. Well, he certainly made the most out of it. I'd like it if he was bolder about it like you, Rumi admits, looking over at Midoriya, with the silver-haired girl now sitting on his lap as they watched the students sing around the campfire. I'm guessing you're wondering who that little girl is, right? Melissa leans over towards Rumi, causing her to jump slightly at the sudden proximity. Oh uh, yeah. I haven't seen her around before. She's Eri, a girl he helped rescue from a poor situation last year, before the whole villain war happened, Melissa explains, as Eri gives Midoriya a big hug, her tiny arms barely reach the edges of his torso, the sight causing Rumi's heart to grow three sizes on the spot, it was Izuku's first task force he was a part of after he helped to resolve the incident during the I Expo. He planned the raid and when Eri's quirk ended up being very difficult to manage, he helped her out, becoming like a father figure to her in the process. Rumi mentally sighs as she watches the two interact, the pure fluff between them making the sun look dim. The feelings that it drew up inside of her, she had a hard time explaining even to herself. She watches as Izawa heads over to the girl, Ragdoll following shortly behind, as Eri detaches herself from Midoriya before following behind the erasure hero. But rather than following the pair, Ragdoll had struck up a conversation with her fellow Greenette. Watching the two joke with each other, laughing at some small comment between the two of them. Midoriya's shy smile as he rubbed his hand behind his head nervously. Ragdoll shoving his arm playfully. The deep pit in her stomach as she saw the exchange unfold did not sit well with her. She was the one who was supposed to flirt with him and then after a period of her teasing, he would break down and ask her out on a date. Ahem, Melissa coughs in her hand, as Rumi turns to face the blonde, you might want to make a move on him sooner than later. Rumi sputters at the comment before regaining her composure, and what makes you say that? 
that glare on your face with killing intent as you watched someone else flirt with him, Melissa states the obvious, besides, I know that Izuku definitely likes you, at least as a hero. He did put a lot more time into making your gear than any other piece after all. I wish you the best of luck. Melissa gives Rumi a small bow before waving goodbye, skipping over to Midoriya as she pulls him into a hug, distracting him from Ragdoll. Maybe she had a point, and any more time around the pussycats definitely wasn't helping her case. If only she had a way to get him to date her. Equals 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 equals. The rest of the camp ran by in a blur, with Rumi being but on bruiser duty alongside Tiger. She occasionally moved over to help the students with heteromorphic quirks, being the top hero with one herself helped her cause in the end. But in the end, she had a lot of fun being able to spar with the different kids. Tiger was no slouch as well, leaving her bruised and with a feral grin across her face, as the different students cheered them on. In the back, she spotted Midoriya cheering her on with Eri riding his shoulders. And with that kind of absolutely adorable encouragement, there was no way she could lose. And throughout the week, she talked more and more with Melissa as she did maintenance on Rumi's prosthetics. Apparently Midoriya had given her the task to check in on it each evening, to help promote Melissa's own skill and to keep Rumi in tip-top shape. And that gave Rumi plenty of time to learn about her green-haired co-worker from someone who he considered to be a little sister. She learned about who he was, the different work he did for the heroes, his relation with All Might and all kinds of pros. How he ended up on I Island, his low points with coming to grips with his quirklessness and high points in graduating and helping people save the day. Turns out, his doctorate had won several awards in how it looked at the identification of quirks and its influence on people. And it wasn't even his only one. One of them was apparently even on her specific prosthetics and its interactions with quirk physiology. And learning that what she used every day was not some normal hero prosthetic but rather a potential next step in an entire medical field did not send her reeling each morning when she reattached them to her nubs. But the best part with her time with the blonde support engineer was the girl talk, learning all about Midoriya and what he liked and didn't like in terms of interests. It turns out her wearing her hero costume in almost every encounter she had with the greenette was severely in her favor and her own workout routine gave her even more points. But now was the final day of the camp, with each of the kids having now been told to sleep before they needed to catch the bus in the morning to head back to the dorms. Luckily all of them were absolutely exhausted after their week-long period of intensive training. Who knew? Stepping into the small living space reserved for the teachers, Rumi looks around the room to find the rest of the teachers present. The female pussycats were all sharing a couch, Tiger apparently having gone to spend the weekend with his partner after all the training had finished. Izawa was slumped over in his sleeping bag, leaning against the far wall as Sekhajiru joked quietly with Midoriya. And the green at himself was laughing softly at his joke while the white-haired girl slept softly in his lap. The soft rise and fall of her chest as Midoriya stoked his hand through her silky hair slowly, easing the little girl into a warm slumber. She could agree with the other pussycats who were currently cooing over the site, it was too pure that which not enough pictures could capture. Heading over to an open seat on a couch opposite from him, Pixie Bob leans over to her, holding out a can of beer for the rabbit heroine. Want one? To celebrate the final day of camp she waggles the cold can in front of Rumi who just stares at it for a second. Send me one of those pictures of Midoriya and the girl and I'll take it, Rumi stares down the blonde heroine who simply giggles as she shoves the beer in her hand. Deal, it was going to be sent in the group chat anyway. Cracking the can open with a hiss, Rumi takes a sip of the bitter liquid as she glances back over at Midoriya. He was wearing one of his more casual outfits, rather than a more professional jacket or vest. One of his short sleeve button UPS was open, revealing a shirt that simply read pants underneath it. With some ripped jeans and his signature red high tops, he looked great in it, especially whenever he moved his arms to accidentally show his toned muscles. Maybe he knew he was teasing her with the view. Quickly. The conversation started up between the group, talking about the results between the different students. Sekhajiru definitely had a few things to say about there being a one of favoritism, but all Rumi could say was to bring it up with Nezu. And as the time passed and a few more beers, Rumi slowly eases herself into the group, laughing comfortably with the others as she opens herself up more and more to them. After some time, Izawa finally pries himself out of his sleeping bag, walking over to Midoriya. With a silent conversation between the two of them, the green Ed cautiously wakes the slumbering girl on his lap. Stretching just like a small kitten, 
she blearily reaches out for Izawa who picks her up into his arms. All right Eerie, let's get you some rest. We've got a long day of travel tomorrow and it would be illogical to not be ready for that, Izawa explains with an unusual softness, as Eerie nods unconsciously. God my knee aches, Izawa mutters as he reaches down to his fake leg. Oh yeah, a cold bath followed by a massage does wonders for that, Rumi agrees, understanding the sensation. Maybe she could get Midoriya to do that massage for her. And with that, Izawa heads out of the room, the small silver ball of sunshine resigning for the evening to the collective pout of the heroes. But after a short memorial for Eri and Sekhajuru heading to bed as well, the room readjusts itself as the pussycats spread themselves out, with Ragdoll now sitting next to Midoriya, much to Rumi's displeasure. The conversation picks up again as the different pussycats start to talk about their quirks, Midoriya quickly elaborating on the ideas he had for each of them, his hands twitching almost like he had a pencil and notebook in his hand to write down all of the words coming out of his brain. But then it reaches the other greenette in the room. So you got your quirk back then, Ragdoll san. Midoriya asks as he turns to face Ragdoll, throwing one of his arms over the couch. Oh yeah, it was such a relief when it returned. We didn't even know if I was ever going to get search back after all for one stole it, Ragdoll shakes her head, remembering the struggles in her past year before picking up the mood again, and I said for you to call me Tomoko, Meow. UMM right, Midoriya blushes before he coughs, returning to thinking about quirks, but was there any feeling when you knew it had returned to you? Meta quirks like that are extremely rare and with how, let's say uncooperative, all for one would be for studies back then, we know basically nothing about it. Ragdoll hums for a second, recalling her time during the final war, it felt like there was a bungee cord connected to my very being, and when it was stolen, it was like it was being stretched to its very limit. It was wound around something else to the point of where it was stretched so thin, that I couldn't even feel it in me myself. And did it snap back into place once all for one had, umm, lost. Oh yeah, I almost recoiled physically at the sensation before my mind flooded from the information from search, Ragdoll explains before letting out a small laugh, I cried so much when I felt it again, it's definitely not something I would want to go through again. Wow. That fits pretty well in the vestigial quirk theory. Maybe then quirks are tied to our souls or something similar. Some quirks are able to sense things like that so perhaps it's all connected together. But then maybe the thermotokirk justices thought connection then? Erasure silence s and while copy replica tes it, but then would tab out one for all. Is there a connection then posit from person to person, maybe he overlap in court says what causes then a to go mad, but then would the plus alpha element be direction observation oft hat connection dash. Rumi smiles to herself as she watches Midoriya get absorbed into his knowledge and theories about quirks. It was nice to him to enjoy his work, and it was a benefit for all of them for him to express himself. And it doesn't hurt that his mother is kind of cute as well. Hey, Ragdoll pokes his arm causing Rumi to suppress a growl as Midoriya is cut from his mother, watch you talking about there. Yeah. You say all kin of things in debt. I couldn't understand any of that. Pixie Bob slurs her speech slightly, clearly having one too many beers. Oh sorry about that ragdoll san, Midoriya rubs the back of his head in embarrassment, just a few ideas I had about what you were talking about. Hey. What did I say, Mia? Ragdoll leans in closer, to Mokyo. Right, sorry Tito Moko-chan, Midoriya gives a small smile as Ragdoll leans back on the couch. Rumi picks up the other pussycats giggling to themselves at the interaction. Ah so they were in on it. So maybe Melissa was right about Rumi needing to make a move sooner rather than later. No worries, but why did you want to talk to me about it, Mia? Ragdoll tilts her head, curious about the other greenette. Well I know that you were functionally quirkless for a time and well, um, being quirkless myself I know it can be difficult at times. So I just wanted to check in with you that you're fine after all of that, Midoriya answers, giving a warm, kind smile to the heroine. It made Rumi happy about what he was saying, having more confidence in himself. It looked good on him. Ah, oh, that's awfully kind of you to ask about little ol me, Ragdoll teases, laying her arm across Midoriya's one along the back of the couch, how about you stay for a couple more days? I know your students will be out on summer break, so you'll have some free time then. Eri can stick around, and she seemed to be getting along with Kota. So how about it? Shit. She was making her move. Rumi needed to do something while she still had a shot. What to do, 
what to do. Sorry, Izuku's got a date with me to the hero billboard chart soon. He won't have time for you with that, Rumi says with a smirk before it drops quickly as she realized what she had just said. Mandali and Pixie Bob looked back and forth between Rumi and Ragdoll, who was giving a serious glare towards the rabbit heroine. And Midoriya, well he was just frozen solid. Uh dash the green at brain had clearly blue screened. Shit, is all Rumi can say before she runs out of the room. Behind her, she can hear Midoriya giving an excuse to the pussycat before he quickly follows her out the room. Maybe it was the beers, jealousy, or how accidentally hot Midoriya was, but she couldn't believe that she had just said that. Pacing back and forth, Rumi starts to run through the possibilities in her head. Midoriya accepts it as a date, Rumi gets to date him, Rumi does the happy dance. Midoriya declines it as a date but wants to go anyway, Rumi takes longer to date if she has a chance, Rumi still gets support gear and the ability to walk. Midoriya declines outright, he is mad about using him to get back at Ragdoll, they become distant again and Rumi is sad, not good. Turns out the Ragdoll was already dating Midoriya and now she has the whole wild wild pussycats against her, Rumi moves into the mountains and never looks back. It wasn't looking good for her chances when she feels a pair of strong, comforting hands land on her shoulders, shaking her out of her thoughts. Looking up to the owner of the rough callous hands, she sees the man she was just thinking about, with his emerald green eyes looking down at her in worry. Myriko, I thought muttering was my thing, Midoriya jokes, removing his hands and taking a step back, I I was a little surprised about what you said back there. Oh um, Rumi pokes her fingers together, in extremely uncomfortable territory. She was acting nothing like her usual self. Was that what Midoriya did to her? Sorry about that, I kinda just blurted that out, Rumi lets out a small awkward chuckle, I got my invitation to it earlier this week and wanted to ask if you wanted to go. It doesn't have to be a date, unless you want it to be. Rumi finishes her offer with a teasing smirk, regaining her confidence, hopefully cluing him in on her intentions. Oh uh, I'd love to. I've always wanted to attend. Midoriya cheers, making Rumi smile brightly. Great. It's a date then. You better show up wearing something nice, I've been wanting to see you in a tight suit, Rumi pokes his chest with her good hand, pushing him back slightly as he blushes feverously. Um, why yet? I it's a date, Midoriya stutters before turning to the wall next to them and slamming his head into it, oh my god I have a date with Myriko what in the world did I just do? Call me Rumi, Izuku she whispers into his ear, causing him to jump as Rumi laughs, walking back to her room. Well now she couldn't wait for the hero rankings to come any sooner. Especially now that she had her catch. Hopefully she didn't just completely destroy any relations with the pussy cats though. But for now, Rumi got her date with Izuku as she closes the door behind her, hopping around in excitement, doing her happy dance. Equals 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 equals. Standing outside the doors to the large event hall for the hero billboard chart, Rumi is trying her best to calm down her date, and if that doesn't make Rumi happy. I'm just nervous, you know. Everybody in there's either a hero or the press, I just don't fit in there, Izuku mutters under his breath, pouting to himself as he looks over at Rumi, gaining a small blush. Man, you already know like half the people there and they love you. Rumi comforts the greenette, grabbing his arm and pulling him towards the door, I can't be seen dating a coward after all. Alright, I can do this. Izuku regains his confidence, standing up straight and tidying his outfit. He was wearing a crimson pinstrip suit, complete with a cream-colored dress shirt and a cute black bow tie. What she liked the best about it was how tightly it fit around his build. With how she snuck in a message to the tailor to make it slightly smaller, her work was paying off. Don't worry, you look hot in your suit. Just the way I like it. Rumi teases as she opens the door to the event hall. And so does your hero costume, she hears him mutter under his breath as the noise of the hero billboard chart fills their ears. Throughout the room were all kinds of heroes, ranked high and low and including the new selection of heroes that remained after the war. Heroes that had retired during the war had generally stayed retired, like the previous top 10 hero Yorui Musha, but other heroes, like Death Arms, who retired but returned to duty after being thrown back into the thick of it, were welcomed back in open arms. They couldn't afford to be picky at the moment. Rumi herself was confident going into the day, having already secured her place in the top 5 during her previous ranking. But after her work during the war, 
and how she helped to stomp out the remains of the PLF, she felt that she had a chance to move up. But leading up to the day was a whole different story. Given how she actually managed to ask Izuku out on a date, she wanted to give a good impression, to make sure that Izuku knew that he made the right decision. But then that caused her to panic, spending way too much time ranting to now about what color dress she should wear to the event, only to be reminded that as an active hero, she needed to wear her hero costume. Well then at least she had a hot dress waiting for her on a future date with Izuku. And yes, she fully planned on more dates. But what's a better first date for a hero and quirk nerd that to attend the prestigious hero billboard charts as the guest of a top hero? Mentally, she was thanking her tipsy brain for coming up with the idea and to send some kind of gift basket to now for planting the seeds there. This event let him enjoy himself while being able to accompany Rumi through the whole ordeal. And letting the other heroines know that he was off limits in a very public fashion. She was really looking forward to seeing the pictures and news articles about Izuka being seen with Rumi during the event. It would make a good new background for her phone, replacing the one she had of Eri and Izuku together. Eventually, the two of them find their seats, with Rumi sitting near the front due to her ranking. And that meant that Izuku was sitting right next to her. To be honest, he did stick out like a sore thumb, being this relatively normal looking guy sitting between a battle crazy rabbit and a guy covered in wood. But at least Izuku managed to bring along a notebook for when he could talk to some of the pros. And with the presentation beginning, the fans from outside filled in the space in the back of the room. The event hall filled with excitement and noise at the first hero billboard chart was starting after the gruesome war against the villains. Rumi found her hands locking with Izuku's. They fit nicely, her own smaller ones matching into his own callous ones. It gave her even more confidence than she already had, being able to show the world that she was there, despite her own severe injuries. And how she had one man to thanks for it. The event started out seriously, going over the consequences of the war, a reminder and moment of silence for the heroes lost in the fight against evil. They had lost some good fighters there, with Endeavor being seriously and perhaps permanently injured from his own fight. Edshot had also given his own life in the fight against Shigaraki, sacrificing his own to save several students from dying after a particularly devastating blow from the mutated man. Hawks had also retired, due to his own injuries. But from what she had heard, he was actually much happier, being able to leave the life of a hero behind him and start anew without the chains of his past. And before the rankings started, there was a long segment about the passing of All Might. It brought tears to many, especially to the green-haired man next to her. The different lower ranks were then called up, a lot of the new generation of heroes finding their spot there, especially after their contributions during the war. Towards the end of that segment, the pussycats were called up themselves which Rumi noticed a glare from the newly returning ragdoll. Rumi just smiled and waved back, totally not showing off how she was holding hands with Izuku. But then was the time for the new top 10. This segment always brought in the biggest news, controversies, and promotions. Rumi remembered the first time that she was called up, the year before All Might had joined UA. It was for when she helped take down a particularly giant heteromorph who had decided to attack the largest bank in Japan. With how quickly and efficiently she took them down, and the grandiose display that she made, there were a lot of new fans for her after that happened. She's Hida and Gang Orca were still, once again, back to back as they rounded off the bottom of the top 10. They couldn't stop bickering with each other as they went onto the stage, giving their small statements before taking their spot next to each other. Wash stayed ranked the same, but the first surprising ranking was MT Lady who ended up moving from rank 23 all the way to 7. Rumi had to guess it was due to how much she helped during the long period of the war, and her contributions in the final battle. Rumi was pleasantly happy as well, having yet another heroine breach the top 10, especially one that she now worked with as well at UA. And following her up was Rumi's, which she could admit, friend following, staying in the top 10 but moving from 10 up to 6. Ryukyu had been injured during the initial raids that kicked off the war, but her fight caused Shigaraki to be delayed before any more damage could be done, something that Rumi could really respect. But then was both a surprise and not one, as Lemillion jumped all the way from a provisional license to being rank 5, Rumi's old rank. Before the war even started, he was already considered a top contender for a high ranking early on in his career. But his sudden boost in power and victory over Shigaraki to essentially save all of Japan gave him plenty of sway in his first ranking. Naturally, he gave a speech reminiscent of the cheesy ones that All Might used to give when he showed up for the billboard charts. But the tears from Izuku made it worth it to Rumi. K 
Kamui Woods work in detaining the large army of fake twice from overtaking all of the battlefields helped move him up to rank 4, giving a quiet, short, and stoic thanks to the public for their support. And then it was Rumi's turn. And at number 3. The battle bunny continues her climb, nothing could stop her now, Myriko, the announcer calls out into the event hall, signaling Rumi to head up on stage. With one last squeeze between her and Izuku's hand, she leaps straight onto the stage, giving her classic feral smile to the crowd and cameras. But after looking around the room, she finally settles on her date and her smile shifts to her softer one as he looks back at her, offilling his sparkling emeralds. I'd just like to say that I'm not slowing down at all. Rumi shouts into the microphones in front of her, because of the help of my support engineer, I wouldn't be standing here today. I owe this all to him. The crowd cheers at Rumi's short speech, with a few gasps from the fans as they noticed the recognition she gave to another person, something she very rarely did in public, even more so at such a large event as this one. Taking a step back on the stage, the last of the rankings were revealed, with Best Genus taking Hawk's old spot and Endeavor maintaining his status as the current number one hero, even through his injuries. But as the HSPC gave their final speech to the fans and public, Rumi's eyes gravitated towards her date sitting in the front row. With tears rolling out of his eyes and a wide wobbly smile adorning his face, Rumi smirks smugly, knowing that she managed to land such an amazingly caring guy. And as the event came to an end, Rumi was ushered out to the back of the stage, to answer a few questions and take new pictures for the rankings. She rushed through them of course, wanting to reunite with a certain green-haired man. Outside the event hall with the late summer sun crawling back under the horizon, she spots him waiting outside, scribbling away in that little notebook of his. It was quiet out, with most of the media and fans already having left after the excitement of the billboard charts. Izuku. Rumi shouts, causing him to look up at her, his sparkling eyes and bright smile widening at her appearance as he runs over to her, wrapping her in a tight hug. Rumi. I can't believe it. Rank 3. That's amazing. Izuku gushes about her, something she'll never not enjoy. Yeah of course, did you expect any different? Rumi smirks at him, causing him to laugh a little. Nope. But I, I don't even know where to start, Izuku starts to trail off, looking down at the ground before returning his gaze to her, complete and utter adoration filling his emerald eyes. You are such a wonderful person and hero, so strong and powerful. You stand for so much and mean so much to so many people. I still don't even understand why you asked me out to this, Izuku admits bashfully, looking guiltily at his shoes. With a swift kick to his rear end, causing him to yelp in surprise, she looks him dead in the eyes as she pulls his collar down to meet her face, hey. I know I'm great and all but that's all because of the help you've given me. Before you a and meeting you, I would have never admitted to having help, or the way that it's made me a better heroine than I could have imagined. But what I don't appreciate the most is someone putting down my boyfriend. Oh oh, Izuku's blush appears in full force, his eyes darting between the ground and her face before he asks nervously, S so you really wanted to date me then? And as any good rabbit does, and as her mother taught her, she mashes her lips against his own. A rabbit always takes what's hers after all. After taking the moment to enjoy the intimate contact with the man she had fallen for, he separates from her slowly, as the two stare at each other emotions full in their eyes. I I won't say that I was expecting that, Izuku lets out a small laugh, his full blush still present, I wasn't really expecting anyone to want to date me, being quirkless was always a big turn off for people. Really? Rumi looks at him, fully confused, I get that some people have a problem with it, assholes by the way, but you're an amazing guy all in your own right. I mean, I was seconds away from losing you to Ragdoll before I decided to ask you out myself. Oh oh, was that what s she was going for back at the summer camp? Izuku asks with full honesty. Oh yeah, Rumi flashes him a feral smirk, but she lost out. And I don't mind that you're quirkless or not. Plus, it might help with getting some cute kids down the line, with them having a better chance of getting my quirk then. Already thinking about kids. Izuku questions her, a mischievous glint in his eyes, that's already pretty soon. My mom would be glad to hear about it. Rumi sputters for a second as she realized what she had just said, which even she knew was early to say on a first date. But as she watches Izuku laugh to himself as they head on their way back to UA, she can't help but think about their future together, and how much she was looking forward to it. Chapter 7, Epilogue Ah, oh, 
I wish I could be there to see them go, I imagine it's going to be a memorable one, now sighs dramatically. Tsk, then why ain't you here then? Well it's not every week that I get to spend time with Kiki after all, Rumi begrudgingly accepts the excuse, and there's always next year. I mean shoot, you still haven't even met Izuku yet and I've been with him for over two years now. He's always somehow busy when we meet up for drinks. Well I always wanted to meet him for the first time at a big occasion, like when you're first class graduates but the timing just didn't work out this time, Rumi snorts, of course that was her plan, besides, your wedding works just fine as well. What? Rumi shouts, before staring at her phone angrily, what the fuck do you mean by that huh? Hee <laughs> hee, you know it's going to happen sooner rather than later, now giggles over the phone, but in the meantime, my girlfriend's about to get back to be with some coconuts and I don't think I'll be drinking them. You, keep your sex life out of my ears. You talk too much anyway, Rumi sneers at her phone. Men Rumi, we're all adults here. Besides, you should hear yourself when you talk about your little Izuku when you get drunk, now teases her. W whatever, Rumi can feel her face warm up, but you know how he is. Yeah yeah, he's your rock, your pillar, and all, Rumi can hear her eyes roll over the phone, you have been much happier since you hooked up with him, not like before when it was just from your battle junkie high when you took down a villain. Well she wasn't wrong. Rumi had felt happier than ever before since she took the job at UA and met Izuku. But it wasn't like she still didn't enjoy fighting a giant villain through her own might and power. She loved the time when Izuku made her special rocket-powered prosthetics for her birthday. Rumi ended up completely dismantling a quirk trafficking ring over the weekend through her adrenaline high when using them. And Izuku was happy because he got a new Miraco figurine based on it afterwards. Her own affection was also a nice bonus. Well enjoy the Bahamas then, Yadweeb. Thanks, go say goodbye to your kids Rumi. I know that you're trying to distract yourself, now says softly before their call ends. With a sigh, Rumi turns to the stairs leading up to the stage. It was graduation day for UA's hero class and the time for Rumi's first hero classes to earn their licenses. It had been three years since she accepted the job that was pressured onto her by the HSPC. But now she didn't regret her decision at all. Walking up the ramp, she spots the rest of the teachers discreetly talking amongst themselves as Nedzu gave one of his famous speeches to the parents and students in the crowd. She had her spot in the lineup, towards the end to talk to the graduating students before they walked off the stage to symbolically start their career as official pro heroes. Her time spent as a teacher had given her a lot of time to prepare what she wanted to say to each of the students. As she walks past the teachers, each of them gives a small nod of recognition, with Izuku giving a soft squeeze on her shoulder and a warm smile to her as she walks past. They didn't have the time for any more physical affection while the cameras were rolling on them. It was nice and humbling to see all her kids go, with the feeling of pride swelling in Rumi's chest as she gives her farewell to each of her past students. With her training, she knew that each of them were strong enough to survive out there in their own right. But eventually, the ceremony ends, the parents hugging their children, taking pictures to celebrate their accomplishments. Rumi quickly snatches Izuku as each of the teachers head off the stage. She was hoping to make it out of the school's front gate before any fans of hers within the crowd could stop her for an autograph. She really wanted some cuddle time with Izuku. But as the pair make their way towards the exit of the school, Rumi instead is stopped by one of her students. Yatsubashi Akari, nervously fiddling with his hands as he approaches his teachers. I, uh, I just wanted to thank the both of you for what you've done, Akari bows deeply, I wouldn't be here without the both of you. With what happened in my first year, I wasn't sure if I could be a hero, but you showed me that I could despite my past. Izuku places his hand on Akari's shoulder, causing him to look up at the green ed, I was more than happy to help, you'll make a wonderful hero. And you had some great applications for your quirk that I was ecstatic to look into. If anything, I should be thanking you. Yeah. Rumi chimes in, now we need to fight for real. Then I'll see you out there in the field. Akari's eyes start to water as they dart between his teachers, thank you. I won't let you down. Izuku chuckles at the sight as their student walks back to his adoptive parents. In return, Rumi playfully punches him in the arm, knocking him a good foot away from her. But with the events of the day having gone and passed, the couple make their way back to their shared apartment, just a few minutes walk from UA's campus. With the developments in their relationship, Nedzu had recommended that they move off the school grounds, 
in case something happened that a student would see that they really shouldn't. Their relationship had gotten out to the public right after Izuku had attended the hero billboard chart with Rumi for their first date, when a reporter managed to catch the rabbit heroine after she took down a bank robber. And being the rabbit that she was, she proudly announced it to the world, telling all other women to back off her man. Many tears of sadness were shed by different men around Japan at the news. But now, Rumi was watching her boyfriend cook dinner for the both of them as Rumi unwound her body from her patrol earlier in the day. As usual, Izuku would make an amazing house husband, with his cooking being one of Rumi's favorite things about him. After a warm dinner, Rumi pulled her Izuku onto their couch, detaching her prosthetics to cuddle with her giant green pillow. She still needed to process the fact that her first class of kids had just graduated and Izuku was her solution. You know, I can't believe it's been three years since we met, Rumi whispers as she nuzzles her nose into Izuku's green curls, those kids were the class that were the reason that we really met. Oh yeah, Rumi feels Izuku's body rumble with his small laugh, you were really aggressive with me during that first heroic class. Shut up, Rumi can feel her blush rising, you were just an awkward nerd back then. Even now you're still a huge hero otaku. But they're all so cool. Izuku exclaims, twisting on the couch to face Rumi, wrapping his arms around her as she sinks into his chest, I can't help but appreciate them. Rumi snorts as she feels him run his fingers through her silky hair, you've got enough Miraco merch now to make an exhibit at the All Might Museum for me if you wanted to. Yeah well, I've got my favorite piece of merch here. There's no way I could ever lend it to them. What's that then? You. Rumi shoves him off the couch at that, hearing him thud against their floor as he rolls across the ground laughing to himself, her own blush betraying her. You, Rumi stares him down as she helps him back up, are a giant dweeb. And you love me for it, Izuku chuckles as Rumi latches herself to his back again, I'm glad we met. Me too, Rumi whispers in his ear, enjoying the heat he was giving off. This is nice, Rumi thinks to herself, I don't think I would ever give this up. Equals 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 equals. Six months passed since Rumi's first class graduated. The new school year had started and she began her usual rhythm of classes, running them through the ringer to build up to the sports festival and then their final exams. The summer camp had gone and passed, Rumi still earning a stink eye from Ragdoll whenever she attended. But now with Rumi having her time off for the summer, Izuku had asked her out on a date, with it being his turn to figure out what they were going to do. And his idea was to attend a summer festival which sounded admittedly nice. But with how public and noticeable she was, she always tried to have their dates out of the public eye. But Izuku had shown her the plan he made, with the festival being located in a small country valley, where she'll be relatively out of the public view. He wanted her to really have a break and enjoy herself, so she relented. The Aozara festival was dedicated to an old story about a guardian spirit for the village that it was hosted in. A nice story but hopefully it meant that Rumi would be protected from over-eager fans. Deciding to arrive separately to surprise each other, Rumi had gone all out for their date, ordering a specialized yukata to knock Izuku off his feet. It had a white base and was covered in intricate golden designs of the fields and the moon. With purple accents to finish off the look, Rumi had tied her long hair into a bun with a specially made crescent moon pin to hold it in place. Being the hero nerd that he was, Izuku would easily recognize it as being based on her own hero costume. Izuku, however, went with a more classical design, with a dark green base and lighter green highlights. Tying it around his waist was a deep purple knot, most likely a reference to Rumi herself. And if that didn't make her blush slightly. Izuku's reaction to seeing Rumi walk up to him in her yukata was one that Rumi would never give up for the world, as he stared dumbstruck at her until she had to reboot him. With the return of his stutter and red face, Rumi laughed as she managed to accomplish her goal. Rumi really enjoyed the festival, wandering through the different stalls as she laughed with her boyfriend. The amber glow of the sun falling behind the hills of the valley, the paper lanterns lining the streets glowing softly across the busy streets. They ended up playing a few games at the different stalls that they passed, Rumi's competitiveness always wanting to find some kind of outlet. Izuku found a basic game, a cluster of cups at the end of the stall where each of them got three tries to land a ball in a cup. Depending on how well they did, different kinds of prizes could be earned. Rumi tried her best to land them in, but the damn game was rigged, causing her to miss all of her throws as they bounced against the edges of the cups. Izuku was more successful, landing in two out of his three, which he picked out a green rabbit mask for him to wear at the festival. 
they laughed about it, Izuku looking good as he matched her look with a pair of bunny ears of his own. He did end up tease her plenty about her losing to him as they continued on with their evening. Rumi dragged her boyfriend to grab some food as the streets really began getting packed for the conclusion of the festival. Grabbing some yakitori for the both of them, Rumi was about to grab the both of them some beer to go with it, but Izuku had refused, asking for green tea instead. Saying something about beer not feeling right for their date. And as Izuku guided her towards one of the hills in the along the edge of the center of town, Rumi was eventually spotted. Her ears were a dead giveaway to be honest, but Rumi was surprised about how long it took for someone to approach them. Luckily for her, it was a small family, one with two little girls who dragged their parents over to meet the couple. The girls were nervous meeting someone who was apparently their idol as the parents shyly asked Rumi for an autograph for their kids. One of the girls actually ended up asking about Izuku, who had been standing next to her awkwardly but smiling at the cute interaction. Rumi introduced him as her boyfriend and as the man responsible for the prosthetics she used today to fight the villains. Izuku blushed at the praise, being his usual self whenever he got recognition for his work publicly. The mom then personally thanked Izuku for what he had done, since apparently her girls had been devastated to hear about Rumi's injuries only to see her miraculously return to active duty. But as the festival was reaching its finale, Izuku grabbed Rumi's hand, dragging her up one of the hills as they stood watching the fireworks start. Starbursts of sparkling blue and vibrant red coloring the night sky as kids ran in the streets with sparklers in hand. Izuku had been fidgeting with the hand in her own as they took in the spectacle. Rumi had an inclination about what it was about as he started to talk. You know Rumi, you've always been a wonderful, powerful, and strong hero, Izuku takes a deep breath before continuing, but that's only what the public gets to see. Rumi turns as he takes her faux hand in his other one, facing each other, his love for her overflowing through his shining emeralds. I get to see the wonderful person that is Yosaji Yamarumi, my white rabbit and my mocha girl. They don't get to see how kind you are to those close to you, how smart you are when you work, how supportive you are to your students, how much you care about the people you save, and how loving you are to me. And I wanted some way to s show how much that means to me. Izuku's hands leave her own as he bends down onto one knee. Pulling on a small box, he flips the lid open, revealing a sleek silver ring with three embedded amethyst gems along its band. What w what I'm t trying to s say is dash. Yes. W what? Yes. Of course I'll marry you. Rumi laughs as she tackles him to the ground, rolling with him in the grass as she feels his tears stream down his face. As they laugh, kiss, and cry while they show their overflowing love for each other, Izuku slides the ring onto the ring finger on her real hand. Sitting up from the grass, Rumi stares in wonder at her new engagement ring as she looks up at her new fiancé. And being who he was, he was crying large ugly tears as he tries his best to process what had happened. It wouldn't be you if you weren't crying, Rumi laughs as she ropes her arms around his shoulders, pulling him in closer. Mom's going to love to hear about this, Izuku chuckles before their lips meet, the fireworks popping against the moonlit sky behind them. Rumi didn't realize that she'd ever like being with someone as much as she did with Izuku. And now, they were closer than ever, as a newly engaged couple. Equals 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 equals. Six years passed from when Rumi got engaged to Izuku. They got married later that winter, with now finally meeting Izuku much to his surprise. He ended up confessing to Rumi that he thought that now was actually just a myth more than anything else. Midoriya Inko was overwhelmed at the sight of their wedding, with between her and Izuku the venue had nearly needed to figure out a way to deal with a sudden flood. But that didn't stop her from teasing the newly married couple about Inko getting grandkids sooner rather than later. They decided to keep their own last names, given how public Rumi was as a hero. Izuku didn't mind when she asked for it, saying how their last names really reflected who they were. Rumi couldn't ask for a better partner. Rumi ended up peaking at number two after that, the public loving her newfound side as a married woman and Izuku's absolute devotion to his wife causing him to create a brand new pair of prosthetics that brought her back to her prime. With the old guard from the war stepping down and Lemillion, who was publicly accepted as All Might's successor, at number one, Rumi accepted her spot with as much grace as possible. Which was challenging Lemillion to a fight with several colorful insults before Izuku could drag her away. That video went viral shortly after. But eventually, Rumi did end up pregnant, to a pair of twins no less. The media had a whole firestorm about that. But Rumi didn't care, now having two new kids to call her own for the rest of time. And now, 
it was time to greet the new Class 1A for their first heroics lesson. It had turned into a game for Izuku to show up for the first time during their battle trial to start the year, being the only non-hero in the school. He had always ignored the quirk section on the new students' applications, wanting to see them in person first for his analysis, rather than be influenced by any previous quirk counselors. Izuku has been pretty vague about this class this year, Izuku comments as he sorts through his notebooks for the lesson. He was wearing his normal button shirt and slacks, but now with sleek support gear under his clothes in case he needed to intervene. With some new technology that Melissa had developed, he could easily hide his gadgets, allowing him to keep his normal teacher look. Well it is tradition for you to go into seeing them blind. They don't have their first lesson with you until after this class, Rumi counters. But I haven't even had a hint at them in general, Izuku pouts as he pulls himself onto his feet, he's been a teacher for what, 15 years now. Rumi snorts at his pettiness, hey, we've been around for a while too ya know. And it's been a nice time then, Izuku turns to her with his bright smile, I got to meet you after all. Rumi can feel her blush rising, you're such a dork. And you like it too, his smile turns into a snarky grin before morphing into a faraway look. She knew that look. What's up doc? Rumi raises an eyebrow. He had something on his mind. With that old saying again, her husband looks at her with amusement, but seriously, I've been thinking that maybe you should retire. What? Rumi shouts at him, glaring at him with all her might, why would you think of that? Wait wait. Let me explain. Izuku throws up his hands as Rumi starts to assault him with light pokes of annoyance, I phrased that wrong. I don't mean full retirement, more like cutting back on patrols and stuff. Going on reserve. And why's that? Well I know that Riku and Izumi would like to see you more, Rumi thinks for a second before nodding in agreement, for as much as they like my mom, their eyes light up like you wouldn't believe when it's you that walks through the door. You're their mother and they would love to have you around more. Rumi blushes at his conclusion. Maybe it would be nice to see their daughters more. She had to miss dinner with them every now and then but she always made the time to see them each day. But maybe she could spend more time with her kids, teaching them all there was to being a rabbit. After all, they did both inherit her quirk and they were two bundles of energy and excitement that Rumi did want to play with. I-I-L-L think about it, Rumi says quietly, looking up at her husband. And that's all I ask for, Izuku smiles softly before pulling her in for a chaste kiss, I love you, you know. That I know, Rumi smirks at him before returning the gesture, only to hear the footsteps of their new students in the background. Giving him the signal, he quickly runs over to one of the doors leading out to the battleground, waiting in the entrance to reveal himself. Looking around the room, she watches as the students entered into the observation room, just like how she did all those years ago. And within the crowd as the students excitedly talk about their heroics teacher, she spots Eri looking up at her with bright eyes. All right maggots, glad to see you managed to find your way here, Rumi begins to explain the lesson, spotting her husband out of the corner of her eye slowly walking up to her side, We'll be doing an indoor two-on-two -two battle trial, a fight between heroes and villains. Uncle Izu. Eri shouts as he turns to face the students, his own expression filling with overwhelming joy at her appearance. Among the other students, she can hear comments about her having yet another teacher in her pocket. Excuse me. One of the kids raises his hand, the tallest in the crowd wearing a comedic suit of armor and a sword strapped to his back, but who is he? I'm your quirk theory teacher. You'll be having your first lesson with me tomorrow. Since I specialize in quirk analysis, I'll be giving feedback throughout the lesson on what I see. Listen to your Myriko sensei however, she's the one in charge for the day, he finishes, beaming a bright smile to the students, Eri grinning widely at his introduction. But what makes you so special then? You're not even in a hero costume, the same kid rudely yells out, causing Rumi to frown, what you got some kind of special quirk to bring you here. Nope. I'm quirkless. Izuku proudly announces, I'm not a licensed pro hero but I can help out in other ways. Rumi was so happy to see his confidence grow over the years about his lack of a quirk. Her repeated aggressive reassurances about his abilities definitely helped out in that fact. Tisk, go home then. You're not strong enough to help us out to be heroes without a quirk, this very annoying kid insults Izuku, who keeps his bright smile on his face. Hey. If you're going to keep talking like that, I'll pass it on to Izawa. I'm sure he'd be happy to hear about your prejudice, Rumi scoffs at the brat, 
proudly puffing her chest out in defense of her beloved husband, besides, he could easily beat your ass into Sunday if he wanted to. You're right. He's just a weakling, the other students around him had slowly taken steps away from him, isolating him from their class. Well if you'd like, I could spar against you right here and now, Izuku offers, giving him a soft smile. As if you'd win, the soon-to-be expelled student barks at her husband as Izuku walks down into the middle of the room, the other students making a wide ring around them. Hey honey. Izuku turns back to Rumi, earning a few gasps from the students, care to referee the spar. Sure thing dear, Rumi smirks as she watches Izuku activate his gear, bands of light forming around his arms, legs and neck before forming into his primary gadgets, modified versions of the gear he used in the only raid he ever participated in. The crowd of students murmur amongst themselves as Izuku stretches, as few walking over to Eri as she starts to boast about the utter humiliation that her uncle was going to bring upon their ex-classmate. And as Rumi calls the match, she watches Izuku quickly dismantle the student, clearly dissecting his opponent's quirk and battle style. Performing various counters against the student, he was almost playing with his food as he wore down the brat in a humiliating fashion. Rumi liked this confidence in him, how seeing him fight making her fall in love with him all over again. It made her glad that she got to meet him, and how he became her husband. She truly was the luckiest woman in the world. Alright, that's where we'll leave off for the day. Sorry for the shorter episode. Next one will be longer so I hope that makes up for it. Thanks so much for listening along with me today. If you enjoyed please like and comment down below. It really helps with the algorithms. I look forward to seeing you next time. Ciao for now, lovelies.